See this episode's show notes for our unique promo code to get up to two months of free podcasting service with Libsyn when you sign up for a new account. Get your show on Apple and Spotify. Get helpful stats and all the support you need to sound your very best. Hello, this is Tom Brevoort. You are listening to Into the Night, the Moon Knight podcast. Yes, welcome back, loony listeners. You are listening to Into the Night, the Moon Knight podcast. This is episode 284, and we are rounding out our coverage of the Moon Knight TV show from Disney+. Plus. You are with your high press conchu, Ray. Hello, everyone. And, of course, we are live streaming this panel discussion. And joining me for this sojourn into the weird and wonderful of episodes 5 and 6, I'll go around here clockwise. We have Daniel doing one of uh, the top two protrunies. Daniel, welcome. Greetings, denizens of the night. Excellent. Well, I should call you Mr. Knight. I'm sorry. Um, we also have the power of Chad. Chad, how are you going? Peachy Keen. Excellent. Peachy Keen last time as well. Very consistent. I love it. Um, and joining us for the first time, um, a valued Petrini, uh, a valued loony as well in our group, in our community. Mario, I'm just going to call you Digicom because I think that's a pretty cool nickname you got there. Mario, welcome. Thanks. Welcome to RTK. And thank you for having me. Yeah, no, we're looking forward to I mean, Mario, uh, listeners would know, uh, has been leaving some great feedback. Um, so it's a real, a real pleasure to have Mario on the actual panel discussion to get, you know, to get face to face to talk about talk about these two episodes. And rounding off this little merry band of loonies, uh, none other than Drew uh, Turntables. <laughs> Tombs. How you going, Drew? Good, good. Hello, fellow priest of Kanchu. Drew's come from a, a long, oh my God, six-hour drive, did you say? Yeah, man, this is six hours yesterday, played, woke up, and drove six hours back. So I'm, I'm dragging, but I'm good. Holy moly. Um, and we have some uh, some early um, feed, you know, comments coming in. A huge hello to Joel and to CMK7, Chris, beep, boop, beep, boop, and uh, at the, an unknown, uh, which is fantastic. You are mysterious, as is Moon Knight. Now, guys, uh, before we start, of course, a big thank you to all the Petronis. Um, you know who you are. I'm looking at, I'm looking at you. Uh, a big thank you to all the fraternities and loonies that contribute to the show. Uh, you really do make it the community it is. So a, a huge thank you. And, you know, let, let's keep on going. Eh? I mean, like the TV show's done, but we've got comics. We've got everything galore. Uh, there's plenty to talk about. Uh, also, our principal sponsors, Drew Tombs, uh, Daniel Doing, and Frank, the Think Tank. Uh, big shout out to you. CLZ Comics from Collectors and Dreamland Comics from Schoenberg, Illinois. So, guys, let's, I guess, let's get into it. What we're going to do, I mean, as loonies know, um, Rebecca and I did a, a raw reaction uh, episode to the episodes, but we have a panel discussion now where we want to basically know what all the other loonies kind of think. So we've invited a lot of loonies on board here, uh, and there's plenty of feedback as well. So we won't be able to get through it all, but uh, we'll choose... Uh, a fair few, just to see what everyone in the community has thought of uh, the last two episodes of this TV series. I don't know, guys. Um, I'm going to give Mario first dibs. He's he's the um, the newest member on this panel. Um, Mario, uh, overall impressions. Like, what did you make of? I guess episodes five and six. How did you, you see the show round out? Well, um, like. Pretty much all of us, I suspect. Um, episode five left me with a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. um, the big one, of course, is you know what's real, what isn't, what exactly is going on. But also the question of how are they going to resolve all of the loose ends? You know, what's going to happen to Mark? What's going to happen to Stephen? What's going to happen to Kamshu? Is Harrow going to win? And I was 
pleasantly surprised that despite the short runtime of the final episode, they did manage to fit all those answers in. <laughs> With a few exceptions, and of course, one big exception, but I'm sure we'll get to that. <laughs> <coughs> Pardon me, I've already started coughing. Um, Murray, you so they did fit it all in. Did you find it rushed at all? The last step, I mean, we're going to bounce to the last episode now, might as well. I mean, did you find that too packed full of information, or how did you see the pacing of it? Uh, it was a little bit rushed in the sense that, um, not all of the geography is entirely clear. For example, um, at one point. They've defeated Harrow, but now they have to defeat Amit. And mm -hmm. really, between scenes, they go from the streets of Cairo to the Great Pyramid. Now, the Great Pyramid itself is only about 10 miles out of the city. But there's, there's no real connective tissue there. It's not like they grabbed a car or something. So you sort mm -hmm. of get the idea that, boom, they're here, boom, they're there. That part felt mm -hmm. a little bit rushed. Yep. Um, the ending... After the fact, you know, after the good guys have won, apparently, mm. they, it's definitely a bit rushed in the sense that we don't know what happens to Layla. We don't know how they got back to England. We just know that it has happened. So they kind of cut up the ending a bit quickly. Mm -hmm. Did they um, ever leave the final battle? I think it was paced pretty well. Yep. Yeah, yeah, Daniel, you did say, yeah, did they ever leave? I mean, that they, I mean, again, you could interpret it that way, right? Again, Stephen just waking up. Um, but we, what, what is everyone's take then? Because there was a bit of ambiguity with a lot of the things towards the end. Um, for me, I'm sorry, loonies, we are jumping into the, the last episode, but um, it's hard not to, you know? <laughs> yeah, really. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like the thing with Har Harrow, his bloodied feet in, uh, in the ward, with with um, with Mark. What does that mean? I mean, is that a manifestation of Mark's um, thoughts about Harrow? But if it is, then again, what does that mean? Is is Harrow truly beaten in in uh, in Egypt? And when I've we had, see, I've had a lot of friends him? asking me about it, like specifically the ones that don't that haven't read the comics, mm -hmm. and um. The best way I've been like responding, uh, because I'm almost you know as a, a longtime fan, I'm just as in the dark as they are as to what's real and what the ending yeah. meant. And yeah. the best thing I've come up with is they tried to do what a lot of the comic runs have done, specifically mm -hmm. like like the Lemire run, which they pulled a lot of this from. Never really says if that's real at all. You don't really know at the end of it if he's destroyed Kanshu, if it was all just metaphorical, yada yada. Um, yeah. And I think the show did something similar, whether it worked or not, because I think it was a, a nice way for them to have a cop out if there is no season two or no follow up. It yep. can all just be in Mark's headspace. But also, yes. if they do continue it, then you could just say that he popped back into his mindscape for a minute. I don't know why. That was. I think the cutting that was where it did feel rushed. I liked how they did it, but it it was very jarring, probably on purpose. Mm -hmm. But like. I think it could have taken, you know, they could have done another 10, 15 minutes to make yeah. it a little less awkward. But I think that was part of the purpose of it was to make it feel like if this doesn't continue, then you can just leave it super ambiguous. Yeah. I mean, well, that's how I, I feel. theory about the Dr. Harrow situation, but it's just yes. a story. Mm -hmm. um, I rewatched five and six in preparation for this panel. And more so, uh, in five and at the end of four, and more clearly in episode six, there seems to be a disconnect between Mark in Dr. Harrow's office and Mark and Stephen in the psych ward. Those don't really seem to be the oh, same. Okay, thing. right. Um, the when Mark and Stephen are together, that's clearly on the boat with Bark to be more to be more mythologically accurate in the duat. But when there, when Mark is apparently alone with Dr. Harrow in his office, that doesn't seem to be the same place. Mm. We actually see him switching from the psych ward with uh, with Stephen to Dr. Harrow's office. Mm -hmm. In fact, Dr. Harrow talks about, oh, and now you're telling me the story about seeing a talking hippopotamus. Yep. So 
I get you. And I can't really justify this because there is some blurriness at the end of episode four. Yep. Is that Dr. Harrell's office is in Stephen's mind. Mm Mm-hmm. And those those conversations are Stephen, Mark, sorry, I... Stephen's so nice. I, 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 think, <laughs> uh, I think everyone loves him. Mind. And it's him trying to make sense out of himself and the situation. Mm-hmm. The psych ward, on the other hand, when he's running around with uh, Stephen and Tauret and sand zombies and going through his memories, that's the Egyptian afterlife. Yes. Like I said, there's a little bit of blurriness in the transition, but one okay, so it's nice to you're saying, like his organizing principle and the experience yes. you do what aren't necessarily they're not necessarily the same yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, it's it's that's it's a good an way to look at it. I think that's a great way to look at it. It's it's an afterlife, as Tawarit says. Uh, they were clearly intertwined, like while all those things were happening, but they're not the same place. They're not the same. Yeah, exactly. But okay. the organizing principle, because because it's very much just Mark and Stephen, uh, well, Mark and Doctor Harrow in there so that could very much just be exclusively his mind whereas there's a bit of bleed over with um and one detail that hooked it for me dr Mm -hmm. harrow never leaves his office yeah he seemed very not that he needed to but he seemed very unable to pursue steven and even his guards didn't well i guess the guards did chase after him when they started running down the hallway but uh they never popped back up again when he just started exploring his memories so it, it it you know if it is just his organizing principle like he, it, you could see that he started to exert some sort of control over it, especially with that final scene. But yeah, yes, it is yeah. very interesting that Harrow's not able to leave there, and he clearly starts to see things how he wants to see them. Mm-hmm. Obviously, it still leaves it very ambiguous, but I thought it was kind of cool. Yeah. And another um, thing that kind of supports that is if you look at the lighting in when he's in Harrow's office, it's a little bit too clean. Mm-hmm. As opposed to when he's like in the rest of the psych ward where the lights don't seem to be working quite right. Like it, like it seems right. like it's a little bit sharper in his mind than in the actual afterlife. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's good. Um, Chad, what, what? Sorry, Chad. What did you make of? Um, oh, what do you think of this theory? I guess between the afterlife and the psych ward organizing principle. I'm I'm pretty much on track with that. Um, but there's also another little twinge I have added to that. Mm-hmm. Is the uh, warehouse at the very beginning mm. has a lot of the same themes going, where it's like you have to be granted entry to certain pieces, and you you know it's another part of that entire uh, scheme where you know he got in contact with the rest of his own self at that point. Oh, okay. So you're saying that storage, the warehouse place? I think it might not was... actually exist. Oh, okay. Ooh. Well, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, oh, it's such a hard thing, isn't it? Because you start questioning, you know, Stephen's life actually in in general. I mean, he's talking to his mum as well, which apparently I I read. I don't know if you guys saw in the article an article by uh, Muhammad Diab. There was a scene that they cut, and Muhammad wanted it. He really wanted it in the show. It was uh, Mark slash Stephen meeting his mum in this white space, um, and there's a, a confrontation or just a meeting between them um so yeah um that would have been interesting yeah but i mean that kind of being thrown up in the air we don't know really what's real and and i guess that's the actual point and it makes it really kind of compelling you know us deciding what or discussing what the hell has happened because it's not as clear-cut as you think um but it's interesting um, to see the division in that too because like as comic readers that's like a whole lot of fun. But I think when you're seeing it in front of you with like live action, you, you uh, maybe subconsciously expect more concrete answers. And yes. uh, it's even as someone who like lives for this type of weird, ambiguous mystery stuff, I even I was like, no, I want to have a better idea what's actually happening. But like <laughs> learning yeah. to let yourself be okay with that, that's part of why we like the character in the comics to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, let's go. Let's go back to to episode five, right? Um, so, at the end of episode four, we're met with uh, Mark and Stephen seeing Tawarit, uh, and obviously that fantastic ending, which everyone seemed to, to love. That it's such a turn. I love her ears. Did you, did you notice her ears? Uh, yeah, the, I love it. Just the looking hippo away. Are perfect. Yeah, yeah. 
but we get more of an explanation and that's where we kind of are coming from where Tawarat actually says, you know, this is an afterlife. It's not the afterlife. She mentions the ancestral plane, which of course is the Black Panther, Wakanda. Uh, beautiful, beautiful little connection there. Um, but then episode five was so, I thought was the best, would have to be the best episode for me um, in out of the six episodes. Uh, just we get, yeah, I mean, we get yeah, everything. Yeah, um, we get a, an explanation. I think I put it, I listed it down with Rebecca. There, There's like the Mark origin, the Stephen origin, the Merck origin, the DID origin. We get it all, and it's done really, kind of really well. Albeit Rebecca did say she was a little underwhelmed at the Jewish representation, which is fair, I guess. Um, but, you know, it wasn't a bad I think they did thing. enough to get it across, but like without yeah. hammering it home, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah, sure. and, I think it, and we can get they, into they this could definitely too, like do the story in. where, Sorry, well, Sorry. like they could definitely do the story later on where like Mark's dad dies and like there's you know, like the last story from the from the Doug Mensch run mm -hmm. where uh, like uh, Mark has to like go home and bury his dad and like that could be a whole can of worms to open up for like you know do like a really good story like set in like you know balancing his the faith he grew up with with the faith that he's serving now mm -hmm. so yeah. i, think, oh, no, that, I think that might kind of go into some, some of these comments that were left here and it was a point uh that involves both five and six that i was going to try to bring up early on so yeah. joel lewis said here um the series he likes the series overall pacing except the last episode with felt which felt very fast um and then he said i don't know that i needed a whole another episode but i wanted it to breathe a bit more uh, CMK7 said that he was really impressed by how much they were able to get into the final episode, but it might have been better spread over too. Um, so something I've been talking with a lot of my MCU watching friends about uh, is, and something I've seen a lot of people complain about who do like YouTube things for for these series is this six episode arc setup that Disney has for the Marvel shows, or at least I think all of them so far. I think She-Hulk's getting more than that for some reason, but um. Oh. Okay. The what I've realized is it works really a six a contained six episode arc works really well for characters that we already know. For WandaVision, mm -hmm. it was the perfect amount. It might have got a little rushed towards the end, but it worked. Um, mm -hmm. For Loki, it was totally fine. It was more than enough to fit in what they needed to fit in. But like you started seeing a hiccup with Hawkeye, even though Hawkeye is very established. They were bringing in Kingpin. They were bringing in Echo, and by mm -hmm. the end of six it was rushed. And even though I loved it, like you could tell that the introduction of new stuff was causing them to squeeze too much in towards the end. And mm. the problem that we ran into with Moon Knight is even though I think the show was fantastic, uh, it didn't like they did squeeze in everything they needed to squeeze in. It was impressive that they covered everything. But mm. if you're introducing a new character and you really want to get people to care about them, which they did, you're, you're also going to tiptoe around. It's the same problem we were running into throughout the whole season. People complaining there wasn't enough Moon Knight. Well, how how much more Moon Knight could you have squeezed in while also getting the same emotional effect uh, mm -hmm. from the storytelling they were doing? I think they're going to need to start switching that up for future series that are focusing on new characters. Otherwise, they're going to run into a problem where a lot of casual viewers aren't going to lock on to these the same way. And a lot of comic book people are going to be upset because there's details you don't have time to touch on. And the reason I thought to mention this is the, the Jewish representation point. Um, like Daniel said, they did enough to get it across without hammering it in, and they left it so you could come back to it. Mm -hmm. But also, how much more time could they have focused on it, and how much more yep. effort could they have put into something like that? I know they could have, but, you know, with the time that they had. And yep. uh, I think that's just something I, I'm interested to see if with future series, if they allow more more time and more budget for these new characters because it doesn't necessarily work with somebody that doesn't already have 10 years of history in the movies. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is a good point. I mean, cause I can only just imagine what non comic book fans, what they would think of, or, you know, say Kingpin introduced in Hawkeye and not having watched daredevil at all, not knowing him. It's, it, it's a little, yeah, it's a little bit weird. It would be weird, but we see, we see him and go, Oh, awesome. He's from daredevil. And like, he's got all this history uh, with it. So yeah, that, that is a, a definitely a good point. I well, saw also. Problem. Sorry. Yes. Uh, oh no, yeah. sorry. Go on. It's going Mario. Uh, there's a problem I've seen in 
comics fandom, not only related to the MCU, but just in the comics in general. Mm -hmm. And there's a bit of a tension between what you need to know to understand the story and enjoy it, and what you'd like to, to know to understand the story. Mm -hmm. um, Mark's Judaism has never really been a huge part of the character. There have been multiple arcs where it's not even mentioned. There have been some very good arcs where it has been mentioned. But the fact that he's Jewish doesn't inform the plot as often as the fact that he has DID or the fact that he's an ex-mercenary. Exactly. Like, like Kitty Pride, for example, of the X-Men, where her religious faith has been part of her character more than once. Mm -hmm. So the fact that people want more representation is perfectly understandable and perfectly valid. But do we do we need to put that in the, in the story, possibly at the expense of something else? Mm. That's a hard question to answer, and there really isn't an easy one. Yeah, you're right. And, and again, I think Daniel, as as Drew alluded to as well, you pretty much kind of hit, hit it on the head. There is an opportunity to explore that aspect of Mark. I mean, where we've got the it's very much the Egyptian angle, of course, and and DID in this season. Um, you could really pick. I think between uh, the three, and I know the Judaism uh, doesn't run all the way through the the Moon Knight run, but it's still there. Like I, I still see it as a big part of of uh, Moon Knight. Um, so there's an opportunity there, and maybe yep, they just didn't have enough uh, space in in the season to actually fit that in. Um, but yeah, uh, it's good that that it was. You know, the, yeah, the little star happy of that David they, that they put yeah. it in there. Yeah, and I think they did a really good job with a lot of that from for his character is like they did a very good job of giving you all like unless I missed something or like they missed something you really got the gist of everything that Mark Spector has going on around him without mm -hmm. them hammering any one thing other than the DID for too long. Yeah. And it yeah. did leave a lot of opportunity for however they continue his character to deep dive more of that stuff individually and, you know, with more time allotted to it now that yeah. we've gotten the whole general origin covered. Yes. And I, and I think back to, um, but I, like, I think back to something interesting that I noticed if, uh, if you look back at the one issue of moon, I believe it was issue eight mm -hmm. where, um, he's actually talking with his therapist, Dr. Sturman. And she's like, well, how do you feel? You know, you were raised by a, you know, your father was a rabbi and you serve an mm -hmm. Egyptian God. I think there was a very interesting opportunity to, to see more of that dynamic with this episode, because you see through Mark's eyes, how Judaism in, in how he would interpret it, it it's failed him. You mm -hmm. know, his it, Judaism, his brother died, his mother hated him. His father did nothing because you know being a man of peace you can't really do anything whereas he is then offered another option with an egyptian deity who's like you know you know be my son be my fist and you will have not only vengeance for others but for yourself as well mm. so like i think somewhere deep in the back of his mind just like in like how he explains in the comic like you know his father's faith may have taken him out of Egypt, but his new faith brought him back and gave him justification for his anger. Mm. Yes. Well, absolutely. I mean, Conchie has given him free reign, hasn't he? <laughs> for, um, for, you know, meeting out vengeance. Um, yeah. So it, it is interesting. Um, going back to episode six as well. I mean, Drew, you did compare it to the other shows. I did see a, uh, and you see it online as well, the similarity about the last episode being the all, you know, all the fireworks and, and the big showdown, which and, it did seem very MCU-y. Um, yeah, for, for but Moonlight. I will say in compare, like, here's the thing. I love MCU and that's like, we've gone on this before and I've been on like, I, I that's where I come from. I, you know, I dabbled yeah. in the comics when I was young, but the MCU's what got me to really dive back into them. And I know how it all goes. It's, you're watching comic book movies, and if you're going to be surprised by a big, bombastic comic book ending, and I don't know what you're watching them <laughs> for. Um, but I would, yeah. I, I definitely think, like in comparison to some of, to some of the other ones, like the, they did it really well. And as far as like, 
I don't know. The, the fight was really cool. It felt Moon Knight despite like the real big bombastic parts of it. Mm. And uh, especially the truncheon. Know, like, yeah. Like it. Yeah. The truncheon oh, yeah. fight, the whole yeah. Steven, that whole fight scene after just rewatching it. Like it's, I think, one of the more better choreographed MCU finales I've seen in a long time. Um, yeah, but yeah, I mean, they did squeeze a lot into it, but I thought that it was pretty solid for an MCU finale. Especially mm -hmm. switching between your main character between two costumes yeah. in the midst of a fight. Just, oh, uh, like, the, the, choreo the choreograph and the cinematographer and the stunt coordinator, like, they deserve, like, the highest praise for mm. pulling that off. Yeah, there were a couple of really good um, moves in there. I'm just going to call out, you know, the one that you see in the trailer where he falls back onto the hood of the car and he, mm -hmm. and he throws it. Like but then he, he kind of like twists and uh, it's all like a real person doing. He like twists and it's a really neat way that he kind of gets himself into a good position again. Um, I just, I've never seen kind of anything like that. I thought that was really cool. Um, and of course, Stephen uh, being a lot more adept with, with fighting, I think Rebecca mentioned it does make sense because he did say in episode five, you know, if if Mark's got it like under control, then I've I've got it too. So I think they become closer together in that sense. Like Stevens, like just because my mind's different, my my body is essentially the same as Mark. Um, so I don't know and if I, you honestly, call that muscle I memory think that's or so yeah. cool. Like I know mm. some people have complained about the corniness of him hopping back and forth between the altars like that especially with the uh, the symbiote Moon Knight suit. But like, <laughs> I think it's awesome for a live take on the character not needing to go change his clothes in the trunk of a car. Why not? Oh, if you're yeah. already going to have the suit be that malleable, go all in on it. I think it's really cool and it creates for some really awesome, uh, some really awesome fight choreography that they can get into. And a lot of um, a lot of his personalities working together in a way that I, mean, I, I don't know, I, it excites me. I can imagine if, you have that, you know, as if you are part of a DID system, I'd be interested to know if you find that like fun to watch. Cause I think it's mm -hmm. pretty cool. Um, then one yeah. thing about that fight that I was going to point out the two super moon night parts when Steven finishes that whole series of whooping ass. And then he like throws Run. Harrow into that, the little laundry room and goes and does the suit. Fix yeah. And, yeah. That ooh, was very cool. That part's <laughs> super badass, but Harrow yeah. immediately takes him and throws him into another building into a wall. <laughs> and that was wildly moon Knight. And then he yeah. comes out of that wall with the grappling hook and a kick to the chest, which was yeah. awesome. Totally. CMK seven and Joel both just brought up. Yeah. I think that was just, yeah, they're, they're both just totally said that well. moon Knight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so like him, him taking some hits and being a little bit of an idiot, like it, it yeah. felt like a moon well, night. him taking hits. I mean, that that really is moon night, isn't it? So, yeah, exactly. Um, 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 the Chad as well. I mean, what did you make of the the extravaganza that was the the fight? I think the choreography was pretty much on par with uh, Captain America: The Winter Soldier. Just mm. yes, the Especially intricacies. Especially with Layla's um, flying moves. It was very Falcon, oh, but she had her own style, which was cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, I thought Layla looked bloody kick ass. <laughs> I, I love her so much. When she had that pose, like you know, with the down light on her as she came out of the rubble, like and she, she like, like flicked the, the wings. The first like first yeah. like wing pull with like she's her got, swords. She's got a little bit of a smirk on her face. It's just the it's perfectly shot. I think like you couldn't get any better shot than that. So um, in case we don't come back to it, can I comment on yep. her like suit reveal real quick? Yeah, sure. So, um. I've, I've seen a lot of people being like, okay, well, she's Ta Warrett's uh, avatar. Why does she look like she's, you know, wings? And why does she have mm -hmm. the Scarlet Scarab get up? I had this fun little theory because when she's talking with Ta Warrett, and it's one of my favorite parts of the episode, she goes, your dad would be so tickled to see you right now. And she goes, mm -hmm. you, my father. And Ta Warrett's like, yeah, I met him before when I took him to the Field of Reeds, implying that she knows her dad. And mm -hmm. she, that's when she says, I have an idea for an awesome costume. So part of the thing with the wings, you know, scarabs obviously have wings, but like uh, Diab said in an interview that they originally were going to have Isis be the goddess, not Tawaret. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of leaked into it. I have this theory that Tawaret knew about the, her being called his little scarab and all that cute stuff. And she fashioned mm -hmm. the suit for her based on the, like her dad and not Tawaret as a hippo goddess. So I don't know. I thought like the whole super totally reveal, even though that. it didn't make sense to being Tawera, it was still super cool. 
And yeah. then it like felt more sentimental when I rewatched it and heard the comments about her knowing her dad. Yeah. The only other thing I think I'd bring up is that Moon Knight doesn't look much like a baboon, which is what one of country beasts along with some sort of bird. That's subjective, though, Mario. Calling him bird like is is a bit of a stretch. And also, I did take a close look at her costume in one of the uh, one of the shots where the only one who was well lit, and the scarab on her chest is in fact red. So oh, she is okay. in mm-hmm. fact wearing a yep. scar- scarab. Yes. Yes, um, uh, and uh, a shout-out as well to Looney Olivia. She posted something. I'm sure you guys may have come across it. Uh, she kind of dove into the, the look of uh, Layla's costume, and it very much harks back to uh, to Mart, uh, one of the, the deities as well. And Olivia, I can't remember exactly what she how she said it, but uh, apparently it, it's regardless of it, if it's a scarab or not, um, that's why she has these wings and, and they're, I think they're meant to be like bird wings. They're not really meant to be scarab wings, but it, that's very synonymous with a lot of representation of Egyptian deities. So oh, yes. I think that's where it's kind of come from. Um, but if you look at, uh, yeah, Olivia posted it up on Facebook. Uh, there's a, a, an image of, I think, Mart with very similar uh, garb to, to um, Layla's. So I think that's probably where they got it from. Uh, as well olivia's facebook like interactions and posts have been great too a lot of really informative yep. stuff oh, oh yeah. yeah absolutely hoping to get olivia on uh some future episodes understanding i guess e- egyptology uh and also as well nate i think Looney nate as well he studies it as well um he's he's actually contributed a lot to is understanding a weird that question more. from listening to your guys take on episode five the reaction episode is olivia rebecca's friend or is Olivia just somebody who also knows a lot about Egyptology? Oh no, yeah, I I think they're both separate. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I figured I figured as much. I didn't. Yeah. I yeah, I, all the information Rebecca was getting from her her uh, yeah. I don't know if it was a museum friend or who it was, but mm-hmm. a lot of really interesting takes from somebody who actually knows like historical. Yeah. That yeah. whole side of it. I mean, yeah, I've got some notes on Egyptology uh, discussing the balancing of the scales. Mm-hmm. Um, but of course, I'm just a talented amateur. I don't study this stuff. Oh no! Definitely love to hear it back because that is a big part. Again, um, of guys, I'm I'm bouncing back to episode five, five as well because I know uh, we're quite fixated with the the beautiful finale, which we should talk about. But um, yeah, episode five about the balancing of the now. One of the big things. How did you guys feel? There was a lot of conjecture towards the end of episode five about the scales balancing. Where is Jake? Um, does it mean that Stephen? that identity has to die in order for someone to be worthy to go to the field of reads. It actually posed a lot of these questions, which um, potentially was not good, a good look for um, the portrayal of DID. But um, I don't know, take us through what you guys were thinking during episode five and then the subsequent, I guess, explanation. I remember I I talked with you and Rebecca uh, on Facebook about that after listening to your guys take on it. Cause um, I felt the same way Rebecca did uh, on my first watch where I, I didn't mind it necessarily, but it didn't it didn't stick with me quite right. And then I I rewatched it again, and um, the way I kind of took it is when uh, when Stephen did his whole you know Mark had already accepted that he like Stephen was important to him. Uh, he fought for him, um, mm-hmm. and then Stephen saying you know if if we're, if I'm him, then I got this too. And jumping yes. into the fight, I feel like that was this you know to me it was him. Mark had accepted Stephen as part of him. And Stephen at that point was accepting that he, you know, despite learning that he wasn't necessarily like his history wasn't real, that he was still part of Mark and that he was happy with that. Uh, To me, it wasn't that Stephen had to die. It was that he was okay with what he was. Mark was okay with what he was. Mm -hmm. And they had come together. Um, And then, you know, I thought back to the parts in the Lemire run where he, where Mark, uh, like I mentioned to you guys, I think he um, he makes the moon, like the space moon night disappear. He kills the masked moon night and then he talks to Steven and like they hash it out and everybody disappears. And for a second, you're like, well, that's kind of a bummer that getting over his D- getting over his DID means getting rid of his alters. But they all mm-hmm. come back later in, in the comic series and they're like, We're, we never went anywhere. That was yeah. you learning how to be one with us. Um, so I kind of took it as that where Stephen wasn't dying so that Mark could be whole. They were coming. It maybe just wasn't 
portrayed very well. But to mm. me, it, like it ultimately seemed very nice because, to, as you know, like to me, it seemed like they were all coming together as one, and that's why mm -hmm. he felt balanced. I actually yeah. agree, but in order to explain my position, I have to read quite a bit. I don't know if uh, you guys are up for it, but it yeah, kind of sure, sure. Me the Egyptian concept of the soul. Yeah. Uh, the, and uh, again, I've only ever seen these written down, so if I mispronounce anything, I apologize. Uh, the Egyptian, the ancient Egyptian concept of the soul had multiple parts. But I'm going to focus on three of them: the ka, the ba, and the eb. The ka is like the life force; it's the thing that makes you alive. The ba is the personality, and inside the ba -a is the ib or eb, which is the heart, which I'm pretty sure is what Tara had pulled out of their bodies, and I, and I suspect that their bodies were their individual ba, because mm -hmm. Mark has did. He has one ka, one life force. So what, uh, one essentially uh, animating spirit. But because he has multiple personalities, he has multiple ba. And the concept of ma, which you mentioned earlier, isn't about whether you're a good person or, for that matter, a sane person. It's about whether you're harmonious with the natural order of things. Mm. And one thing I noticed after when I was rewatching it early today is that when the scales balanced out, there were two hearts on the scale. It wasn't Mark balancing the scale. It was Mark and Stephen's hearts balancing the feather. Mm -hmm. So my theory, and this message what Drew was talking about, is that the scales balanced not because Stephen fell off the boat and got petrified, because Mark was accepting Stephen as part of himself. Mm. They were working in harmony as they should be, as opposed to pulling in different directions because Mark doesn't trust Stephen. He keeps secrets from Stephen. Stephen doesn't understand. Stephen isn't really accepted. Mm -hmm. But once they confronted all of that, the scales balanced. And yep. just when that happened, Stephen falls off the bloody boat. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I think, and I agree that perhaps this could have been done better. I think the balancing really had nothing to do with Stephen turning into a statue. I think yeah. the balancing happened because Mark and Stephen were in harmony. Yeah. Yes. Well, and I, I, I noticed yeah. today when I rewatched it, when Mark runs back to him and they and, and as he's freezing, his their hands are over each other. You mm -hmm. can see a glow between their hands, and what that glow is is the the heart becoming an entire whole heart. Yeah, yeah. Look, the way that I um, kind of perceived it as well is that I think Rebecca and I discussed it um, as well. Is that yeah, the balancing the scales, and it, it sounds very similar to what you were saying, Mario. It's not so much the mental aspect of the individual, but I literally took it as the the, the heart, you know because that's what is on the scale. So regardless, and it is funny enough that, or unfortunate that Stephen goes overboard just when the scales balance, but it was a measure of, yeah, they were, they were starting to be a little bit more uh, in sync with each other. Uh, and so, you know, their hearts were kind of in the right place. That's kind of how I, I saw it, but um, I'm glad that you've elaborated Mario because yeah, I mean, that makes absolute sense as well, but being more harmonious rather than being, this identity needs to go. I mean, but yeah, I totally really, agreed. Really I think... cool insight with the Egyptology stuff, like the Ka and the Ba and stuff like that. Yeah. I, I hadn't yeah, even absolutely. thought to look into that. And that's mm, more of those, like, those details that cool. could be explored with more time. But yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, I just wanted to call out as well because CMK7 as well, he uh, he totally agreed with you, Mario. Stephen dying was not what was balancing the scales, it was Stephen sacrificing himself to save Mark, proving to Mark that he isn't a worthless piece of shizzle <laughs> <laughs> so i know thank you chris yeah absolutely so i think there are and i think that was actually um kind of verified in a way in episode six when mark he he's you know he start, he started off hating stephen or, or wanting to suppress him and what we see his conversation with Tawarit at the field of reeds is that he'd give up this place in in like heaven or this paradise to actually go back and get Steven because he, he needs him. Like he, he, and he says as well, you're my real superpower. So he's never alone. He actually relied so much on Steven's uh, outlook as well. So I think in that sense uh, that shows the, 
the, the synergy that they have together. Like he would not want to continue without Stephen, whether or not that meant to be in eternal hell or whatever. So um, in the sands, but yeah, uh, Chad, uh, did you, did these form questions for you as well? Um, a lot of questions that exist for me just kind of rely entirely on whether or not there's a season two. Because <laughs> <laughs> if not, I can just be like, okay, and just cut that off right there. But yeah, right. There's, there's going to be a season two. This thing was way too good for them to be like, oh yeah, we're no, we're just yeah. going to leave it. Because Loki was supposed to be like a sort of one and done. And then they were like halfway through and like, oh crap, we've got like gold here. No, there's going to be a season two. So yeah. there's, there's definitely going to be a season two. They're just going to be coy about it and try to and just like kind of string us along until <laughs> we start to lose hope. And they're like, oh, guess what? Season two, guys. I'm also uh, wondering I if there's a reason for this. Oh, sorry. There's a reason why they didn't announce season two. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're putting Moon Knight up for the best limited series. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And if it's a best limited series, it can't have a season two. Season. Yeah. That's true. And that, in fact, what happened with Loki is they were going to submit it as best limited series. Right. And they put that little note at the end Loki season two coming out. And the Academy said, no, you can't be a limited series. You're going to have a second yeah. season. So uh... as long as they can, as long as it can be submitted as limited series, they can't announce a second season. Yeah, yeah, I, and I, I think also think um, M- Multiverse of Madness coming out the following week. I think uh, it might be a marketing thing too, where they wanted to switch gears straight to Multiverse of Madness push. Mm-hmm. That's and, true, because then well. people can ride out watching the finale for the next couple of weeks. And I wouldn't be surprised yeah. if they announce something in the next few weeks while they've given people time, because like it's it's the MCU, like they can let people dangle for a while and they're gonna yeah. come oh, back. Yeah. Yeah, and I think Chris uh, makes a good point here. Yeah, just just let Oscar get it, the Emmy, and then, <laughs> and then again, <laughs> he deserves it. You know, uh, I, I think he's, he's phenomenal. Uh, he's acting. You know, I'd always heard about Oscar Isaac. You know, oh, he's such a, he's the, the a generational actor and all that. And I'd never really seen much of his stuff. Uh, and you know, albeit this is a, a comic book superhero TV show, but man, I mean, yeah, his acting chops were pretty good. And, and I'm not even a, like a connoisseur when it comes to. To how good acting is but you can you can really see it like he's really Hi. yeah and he, he mentioned as well that although it was the hardest i think few months that he's ever undergone he un- he enjoyed every like every minute of it like he was enthusiastic to do it so let's hope he does that again and takes that on board and we get a second season uh because i think moon knight for sure he 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 Fan, fans call out for it um so, so yeah. I, I don't know if like we want to save something like this for later like uh if we want to mm-hmm. speculate on where we might see him next but i just saw a pretty interesting detail about okay it's not well, related let's... to a season two but it's related to where he might go um so okay. I, I figured well, that might be something we'll talk about collectively later yeah yeah yeah. let's put a pin on that because i want to yeah, i yeah. want to do um where we all think it's going to go from here which is very exciting as well um look might as well it's a good time now i might just dip into uh, some listener feedback as well just see what everyone else thought and look we know um there have been differing um thoughts on the show um some people would want a, a bit more moon knight a bit more of the representation how he is in the comics the street level um for sure so uh we're gonna have some pretty good a pretty good variety of comments here um okay i'm gonna pick one for episode five uh and and i'll try to look i'm trying not to spend too much time here angela angela uh shush and uh, angela says oscar isaac's acting wow he should get an emmy i was bummed the story didn't move further along but i was glad we got some backstory i thought for sure that it was because they didn't uh, they didn't know about Jake why the scales weren't balancing, but um, which is a good point as well. I mean, that could probably explain the lack of Jake. Uh, how much can they pack in the final episode? Hopefully it's longer. Well, we know now it isn't. And I hope they don't show Jake just as a post credit scene. Well, we got that too. Anyway, Angela, mm-hmm. I, I'm hoping you enjoyed it still. Um, you know, the final episode. I mean, guys, in episode five still, I mean, we're talking about Oscar's acting, uh, there's what did you guys think of i guess the re the retconning of randall so to speak um and that whole story and that being that being that basically the trauma and what are your thoughts on wendy 
not uh, Elias being the abusive parent. Um, so, yeah. Daniel? I, oh, oh, sorry. No, go, go ahead. Um, just from the opening credits where we're, we're seeing, like, you know, the, like the the flash of like her screaming, like, you know, it's all your fault. Mm -hmm. you, you get that feeling of impending doom, but then seeing how she reacts, just, it felt so real. Like you really felt like you were taken out of like this grandiose, like cosmic comic book universe. And you were plucked in like someone's actual life. Like, yeah, she did really well. The actor, she was really good. Oh, she did a phenomenal job. Real like, is the like, right yeah. way to put it too. It didn't feel like uh, it didn't feel like you were watching a drama. It felt like you were being made privy to somebody's personal family, like like you're the show. friend sitting on the couch at your friend's yeah, house. Yeah, when uh, their parents for... are going through a divorce or something. Like yeah. yeah, and just like and again, seeing Mark's father, who again from from what we can assume he is a rabbi in this, as he was in the comics. Um, just again, like the fact that he just didn't really do anything. Mm. Like it was just this, like, I, like it, it would have been because like, you know, it could have been from two places. Like either he didn't know how to handle it because, you know, this would have been like, cause if you're going with Oscar being like in his like forties or so, this would have been back in like, like the mid eighties, like before they really knew how to like, deal with like mental trauma like that yeah or from the fact that you know again he's a rabbi he can't like com have his wife committed because that would look bad for him and for the the whole community the jewish community that he serves well and this yeah. kind of plays into your point earlier like the things they set up that that they can explore way more deeply later on mm -hmm. i think if we get a season two getting more of a look back at his relationship with his mother and his father through that whole thing uh, I, I think would be something they could absolutely dive more into in future stuff. Mm -hmm. We got enough of the gist of it to get why it's important and why it worked the way it did, but also it left it up to like, it would be interesting to see more of Mark and his father's relationship and why it deteriorated. Mm, yeah. Great. Definitely. And just in uh, the whole thing with, with Randall, because like it, it always seemed like throughout the, the different runs of Moon Knight, they really didn't know what to do with Randall. First, he mm. he was a serial killer. Then it's like, oh no, I'm I'm a master manipulator, and I had a guy get plastic surgery to look like me. So you thought I was a serial killer? I'm actually <laughs> right, trying to right. replace you as right. Moon Knight. And then, oh no, it turns out I somehow have mutant powers, and I accidentally hurt somebody. Now I'm going to try and replace you as Shadow Knight. Just, it again. It really didn't seem like they didn't know what to do with Randall. I I almost hate to say, it, but like I think he actually serves a better purpose being dead. You know, like yeah. Honestly, like, I I think so too. I, yeah, it was I, really well done because if they just wouldn't have had him in there at all, people would have complained about that too. So, what's a better way to solve that than just kill him off and make him a plot point? Yeah, I think it was a necessary yeah. plot point. Frankly, I mean. The whole one of the, one of the big points of the show is they were treating DID properly, and all the research I've seen and a lot of the commentary I've seen basically says DID happens in childhood. Mm. So in yes. order for Mark to have DID, he couldn't be because of what happened in Conchu's tomb. It had to be something that happened mm. in the past. Yeah, and. Your, bro your kid brother dying and your, and your mother blaming you for it definitely True. says something as a believable trauma that could trigger DID yep. as opposed to what the comics did. And I'm not going to bring that up. Yeah, I was about to <laughs> say. <laughs> Making his mother instead of his father. Yeah. Uh, I think that works because his relationship with his father can be played into later on. Mm. And the fact of the matter is his mother is a non-entity in the comics. She's mm. a pretty much. She just, she just kind of was there in the background going. She yeah. uh, She's appeared on panel twice mm. in 40 years. Yeah. Once yeah. in Shadowland Moon Knight number one, where she has a one panel appearance. Yeah. Cooking dinner. Yes. And two in the Lumiere run, uh, issue 11, where yes. she has actual dialogue. And she gets yes. embarrassed at him yeah. for having a DID oh. slip in their kitchen, which is like... Mm. I, I like that uh, we talked about this, Ray, I think, like 
uh, I don't like it, uh, you know, but mm. I, it was interesting seeing them go the route of the abusive mother uh, instead of the the just focusing on an abusive father or neglected father, uh, yeah. because it's a very real traumatic thing. And I, I've had personal yeah. friends that have dealt with and it's uh, with that. And it's not something that's touched on very much, not especially not in a way that is mm -hmm. uh, uh, realistic and like heartfelt. And uh, I thought they did it very well. And I think the way that they changed things just a little bit on all the points of his family, I think it worked very well for this rendition of Moon Knight in a mm -hmm. way that uh, him finding out that his uncle's murdering people in a basement like <laughs> yeah, maybe yeah. wouldn't have really yeah. worked <laughs> no no i look I, th I think also as well um just the fact that we've had unfortunately we've had a lot of like abusive or terrible fathers in the mcu actually let alone in the comics uh you know you're looking at uh Thanos, um, Howard Stark, uh, Ego, the living play. Look, all the dads seem to be real dickheads. Um, <laughs> so I, I think it was good to just change it up a bit, e even it being as simple as that. But also to the fact that I don't know about you guys, maybe, maybe I, I'm a mother's boy or something, but like I think the connection between a, 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 a mother and son is a different dynamic to a father and son. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And so you especially get that with Stephen. Like he, he's talking to his mum. He's obviously had uh, got a, a close relationship with her. So then when he finally, Harrow tries to dial up her number and Stephen realises that she's dead. I mean, that was one of the most powerful, yeah. I think, scenes for me. Mm -hmm. And it was so sad for Stephen because he had this lovely relationship with this fictitious mum. And then to have your mum in real life be so abusive. And and Chris, a CMK7 mentions as well, yeah, prolonged trauma. So I think, Chris, that was the repeated beatings that he got from his mum. Because um, thinking about it, like, this probably happened when he was about, like, seven or eight. Yeah, yeah prime time, you know. It, think about it. Then he had to deal with almost a decade of abuse yeah no wonder the poor the poor kid developed DID. Well, yeah. and like mark's whole uh, part of it's the the pacifism thing in the comics but like ultimately it comes down to uh mark's distaste for his father other than sending him away to uh putnam is uh his inaction and him being uh mm -hmm. hands off and a soft person and mm -hmm. um i think showing that he had a broken and abusive mother for at least a decade like daniel pointed out in his in he like you said uh when you guys went over it right like his last thing he said to his dad is like why haven't you done anything about this yet mm. um yeah. you it, they didn't have to spell out that he just spent 10 years getting bullied by his own parent and continuously getting deeper and deeper into mental illness and his dad just didn't do anything to help other than give him some birthday cakes and yeah. uh, it was nice that they showed that he was like there for him and that he clearly loved Mark. Um, but it was a really effective way of getting Mark to hate his dad for inactivity yeah. uh, without, I think... without any of like the fighting and the violence being the pull to yeah. it. And, and I think the repetitiveness of the celebrating the birthday for me showed how, um, like how, the lack of an effort i guess of his dad in a way like he he might be trying but all he could think of is to try and you know cheer him up during his birthday uh he he didn't really think beyond that which again yeah. is, is probably disappointing for for mark or stephen that he didn't actually be take more of an initiative um so yeah there are so many conflicting things like it's very sweet of him to do that but it's just not enough in this situation um, inaction is still hurtful mm-hmm yeah, sometimes yeah. more so. Like, yeah, sorry, especially Mario? over the course of a decade, like that's. Yeah, uh, I would be quite pissed off as well. <laughs> yeah, and then and sorry. it's so interesting because when again when we first are introduced to the mom, she's like he seems so happy, so nice. So it almost it gives you this feeling like there is a history of mental illness at least on his mother's side of the family. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. like because again, before this trauma, happy well-meaning mother you know barbecuing yeah. for the for the two boys oh, yeah. as soon as a, a major loss and a, a losing a son wow. would definitely be a major loss just frazzles yeah. her oh yeah she spiraled big time um and yeah it's uh it's chris the official birthdays in the theme of denial absolutely uh, sorry maria you were about to say something 
Oh, I'm just saying that Elias's actions are almost performative. It's sort of like when people offer their thoughts and prayers, but don't uh-huh. actually do anything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he was, you know, the. Oh my God! He beat Twitter to the punch. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. So, uh, uh, I mean, a lot of stuff there. What What did you guys think of another another point that did come up? I guess during the conversations with Loonies, was this fact that uh, it seems like we see the origin of Stephen, right? You know, Tomb Tomb Buster, Doctor Stephen Grant. We see the young Mark in his room, and then we see him change to Stephen, uh, and then his mum comes in. Uh, and then she said, I don't want to have to do this again. So again, implying that she's done this many times. Uh, she takes the belt out and, and the, the door's closed. Now, a lot of people were saying, well, that how is Mark using Stephen as a um, as protection? You know, because Stephen is actually the one privy to that particular beating. Um, I don't know. What do you guys think about that? Um, I yeah, was always chat, wondering about that too, because... Hmm. Uh, you know, Steven gets pissed off that he, he was his punching bag, he refers to it as. But also, like, Mark words things in such a way where Steven was made so he didn't have to remember any of that. Um, mm-hmm. And that the way he worded that, it made me confused. It's just like, so is Steven taking the beatings or is he become is, is Mark taking the beatings and Steven's just completely unaware of what's happening? Um mm-hmm. That and then I started talking to somebody cool. about how maybe Jake became a third alter to, yeah. uh, as a result of the beatings. And he is so violent because he is, he's, you know, the, the protector after dealing with years and years of that. Uh, yeah. So maybe that's why Mark is super unaware of him because he came out of Steven. All, there's all sorts of weirdness there, but yeah, I was yeah. confused by that as well because Steven is such a sweetheart for someone who took 10 years of physical abuse. <laughs> I yeah. don't think that really works. Like, that Steven that doesn't remember any of it, though, tells me that he didn't experience it. Yeah, yeah that's that's a confusing thing, because you see him change, though, just as yeah, his mom the, comes in. Uh, but the thing is, and this is rather critical, we don't actually see the beating. Yeah, that's true. We don't see Mark or Steven being beaten. Theoretically, particularly if this wasn't the first time, and it's kind of unclear from context, Theoretically, that could be where Jake showed up. Yep. Yeah, that, that's, that's what CMK I think everyone said in the comments. That's yeah. that's his theory as well. It's, yeah. a, it's a viable theory, and it certainly explains a lot of uh, of things. Like perhaps Stephen doesn't remember any of it to the point Mark where he, he only people, remembers loving his um, mother to death. Mild yeah. physical abuse. Jake remembers the worst of it, and it turned Jake into who he is. The part that confuses people, I think, is that they, they're thinking of Steven as an interject, that he's playing the action hero. Mm-hmm. When Stephen Grant is near, he has no fear, I forget what the exact line is. Mm-hmm. Yep. That doesn't seem to be the case. If anything else, it's almost like Stephen, Stephen Grant, the Stephen Grant altar is an escape valve. Mm-hmm. Push him away from reality. So, he, mm. so that he's not experiencing it. But the way they play, well, having him look at the poster and then turn to Steven, yep. doesn't really fit with the Steven that we know. It's almost like it that Steven yeah. turned into Jake and then another Steven showed up later, which mm. doesn't really work very well. No. Um, yeah. I'd I love just thought. The script for that scene, basically. Sorry, you love the what? I'd love to see the script for that scene. Yeah, that yeah, that would be interesting. That, that yeah. was one bit that I don't think worked very well. Mm. We have we knew, we've known Steve. We knew Stephen for four episodes already, and he was a really nice guy. Mm-hmm. Kind of a goofball. No way was he an action hero. No, I mean you see the the young Mark when he does change uh he, he's got all the mannerisms of oscar isaac playing steven you know he was all oh, i've got to i've got to clean my room and he's got that english accent as well and he's doing all that so um yeah there's yeah there i don't know yeah it's a bit blurry that that thing i totally agree with you as well because i just took the tomb buster poster like literally maybe just grabbed the name and and maybe the accent of Stephen uh, mm-hmm. Stephen from that post, and uh, not not the personality of Doctor Stephen Grant in Tomb Buster, but I mean we're all it's all speculation, really. We don't yeah we don't know. Can you give yes. credit to that kid for pulling off the altar switch? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was a- Oscar is a, is is a mature actor. That kid did a pretty damn good job all by himself. 
he, he oh, did yeah. a good job. Yeah, yeah, he was he was good. He uh, must he have gotten a lot of pointers from Oscar, like on set, or or that kid was super observant because man, mm. he had that nailed down to a T. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and then uh, I mean, I'm just tr- trying to go through my head uh, as we go through episode five. Uh, there's um, oh look, there's also as well. Uh, I like the little bit where Mark and Steven come across in the, in the psych ward, in his mindscape, all of Mark's kills, basically all of his targets. Uh, and they, they turn up later in, in the duet, but um, there's a, a, an obvious regret that Mark has, you know, he mentioned something about uh, I'm kind of half wishing that one of them would have off me like yeah. during this thing. So I don't have to do this anymore. So he, he, he doesn't, like he doesn't like, and we, this is obvious, but he doesn't like to do what Conchu has got him to do. He's kind of bound into this agreement. Um, he does it well, uh, but yeah, uh, I don't know. So, so seeing also the 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 origin, which was very comic accurate of Mark the Merc, the Temple uh, I thought, of Stork War. Oh, so good. Oh, and I wonder if that was was that ripped from Lemire's run. I asked. Rebecca it's really Lassie, close to it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Looks very pretty old. Accurate, yeah. The, yeah. the shot of him uh, on his the shot of him in the temple as he's crawling towards it, uh, mm-hmm. it that was pr- almost sh- straight from the comic. Oh, nice! Oh. The yeah. one big difference, which was remarked upon, I think, in the Facebook group, is that in the comic he doesn't try to commit suicide. Yeah, yeah. that was a yeah another big thing there. So, what what did you guys think of um, of that? creative license i mean it, what, it wasn't necessary but i i didn't mm. mind it and I, I think it kind of hammered home just how tired mark was of dealing with all the nonsense that his life had been full of up to that point yeah yeah i really i think it was more of a survival tactic because he was like either i sit here and bleed to death suffering until something comes and picks my guts out of me or i just end it right now with no pain no suffering mm. that, yeah. that's kind of like the the hint i got from it because he was like super messed up by bushman which i i love the fact that they made it in the show that bushman was his old co yeah that is yeah true um yeah that could be a cool thing to explore later on in the if they do a season two uh because then bushman would not just be a, a random uh you know warlord mercenary that he runs into out dicking around have history with him you'll have you then we'll get a look at his days in the marines uh yes. his days working under bushman in the marines and then what led to them being you know globe trotting criminals well, uh, i think he, that's a really cool CEO in the marines or is he a ceo as a mark oh, oh like well, i guess i don't necessarily know what a ceo means i, I assume that was a military it's it's a military so, sorry uh chad was a commanding officer yeah yeah commanding officer okay yeah I just assumed that he, meant that he worked under him in the military and now he's doing that's what I'm, jobs that's, with him. That's what yeah. I assumed. Yeah, because mil- the Merc stuff is all kind of off the books, right? <laughs> like, it's yeah. no, you, you don't yeah. have ranks. Like, in, they would in, have loose terms like that, but he specifically called him his old CO. So, meaning he doesn't have the probably, title anymore, but he's still where he's his partner now. Mm. Yeah. That'd be, so that's, interesting. I never really thought how cool that would be to explore further. That, like, like, that could be, that would be cool. a whole series yeah. in and of itself. Yeah, like the fa- if they picked up from like in Vengeance of the Moon Knight when they brought Bushman back from the dead, there's that scene where like Mark's in there with Frenchie and Ray and they're all drinking, laughing, talking about the good old days. Like, like oh yeah, remember when he showed up with uh, yeah. wearing a Magnum PI shirt with a truck full of rocket launchers and saved all of our asses? And they're like, yeah. oh yeah, who? And they're like, Bushman. Yeah. Just like yeah. you, you got that sense that like like him and Frenchie and Mark, they really were like these three amigos until yeah. Bushman decided to just completely throw it out the window because he got too greedy. Bit greedy, yeah, yeah. As as Mark says as well. I love it how they've mentioned Bushman, so he's really out there. Like they alluded to him in the lead up to these last few episodes, but now we've got a name to the to the guy, so that's great. Um, it, just something it was here. fun watching the show with people who had no idea about any of the comic details, and like <laughs> me being one of six people in the room who hears the word Bushman and gets all jazzed. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> like, what's a Bushman? Yeah, what's that? What's that, dude? Um, same case seven. Chris also says, uh, "I thought it made perfect sense putting the gun to his head. It already racked. It's already racked with guilt. He's already racked with guilt, and now he feels responsible for the deaths." 
of more innocence, um, for sure. I mean, I guess he, he was party in some ways. You know, he's with Bushman, so he, um, oh, yeah. yeah, it's so very he, easy to stop him. Yeah, that's, that's right. He tried. He tried to. Yeah, but yeah, I, I saw that as well. He was mortally wounded. It, look, I think like you, Drew. I think. Yeah, I think he didn't need to, but you know, he they put it in there. They put the gun over there. That that was a last resort. Um, yeah, just to kind of highlight that Conchu was basically swooping in just when he was at his, his absolute lowest. At his lowest. Like Sorry. like a like a drug addict uh, being found in the alleyway. Mm. Conchu knew could see the potential that Mark or even Stephen or Jake could offer him, and he's like, ooh. Opportunity. Yep. It allowed Kanshu to start their relationship by saying "what a waste," which is just about the most dickheaded thing in mm-hmm. so Kanshu esque. <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. definitely. Exactly. I love how spot on he was in this because yeah, there, right. yeah. there were moments like, especially during his fight with with Aminette, where you know he's like, you know, like, oh, I'm I am offering a choice, which is, you know, what you're trying to take away. So like, you can see he's trying to be good and righteous. But his like moral any... ambiguity was done very well. Uh, yeah, so like, I, I got kind of worried that they were going to, they've been good about this for the most part, but I got worried that with how Khonshu is, they were going to maybe try to Disney him up a bit. And like, he was funny on occasion for sure. But at no point, just at gun. no point were you made to like him. No. And I think that's why he works really well in the comics is like, he can be very endearing, and he is an, a really cool god of the moon with the bird skull. But he is a yeah. he is a total asshole. He is a total. The only time I really liked him was um, that fight scene with Amit. Like you know, he his, decides his to throw down. Is sick. His, yeah, the he, way he does those little blip, like blip, blip yeah, and then he, he does is kind of awesome. Yeah, he, he totally and... ripped off uh, Nightcrawler there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he does. Yeah, yeah, all that was missing was the little fan <laughs> sound effect with the blue smoke. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> but no, um, yeah, Conchie was great. W- what do you guys think then? I mean, I guess moving on, we did discuss the the duet and and Stephen being petrified, as you said, Mario, and our thoughts leading into it, um, into Mark going to the field of reeds, bouncing back now to to episode six. What did you guys make of of uh, this this coming of Amit uh, and uh, and Harrow? Actually, we haven't really mentioned too much about him, but I think Ethan Hawke did a really good job in the last um in the last episode. It Mostly like seeing him make the switch to like being able to submissive. fight and being a kind of a badass and, and it not yeah. feeling weird or awkward. Yeah. Oh, but I was talking about him being quite submissive towards um, and I think that was oh, I think like, that scene, the that scene was thing great. where he's like, Well, I'm I'm ready to die because yeah. I know my skills aren't balanced. And um, it's like, no, yeah. no, no, I think I'm gonna keep you around. Watching yeah. that the second time really hit too, because if you pay attention, like his acting is fantastic as he's talking to Amit and realizing that after all these years of his uh patronage to her um traveling the world doing all this stuff building her cult he still isn't worthy as he's talking his eyes just start get more and more red and he starts like he's crying because mm. he's realizing that he's done all of this and it didn't really mean anything and he's yeah. also realizing that his god isn't as strict as she says she is and I almost wonder if he's losing some of his faith that it, like, yep. it's interesting to see him still being so on board with following her, uh, her path yep. while also hearing her say that she's going to make like a, she's going to make a caveat for him because she yep. wants him to do the work for her. Yep. And I feel like that's, I, they don't explore it, but I thought that was a really cool dynamic break where he's like, I'm still accepting your judgment and you're not even going to follow through on it. Uh, like maybe he didn't even want to still be her avatar at that point. I don't know. I thought it was really interestingly done. I love, love, loved the fact that he was willing to die. Yeah, mm. he yeah. was. He at was, no point did he lose he faith so in what his power was. He was an absolute believer, one hundred percent. Yeah, that he was saying, "Well, I freed you. I don't want a reward. Yes, my scales are out of balance. Judge me as you would. Yep, I'm happy to take he's a hypocrite." <laughs> which apparently is de rigueur for the Egyptian gods, <laughs> doesn't change the fact true. that he was a true believer, that he yeah. wasn't a traditional supervillain with an agenda of his own. No. His agenda was her agenda. She's yeah. the one who, who betrayed him, not the other way around. And yet, even then, he still fought for her. Yeah. That's insanely good writing. Yeah. Yeah. 
I to, think to a... see that your God is fallible and yet you still will follow just shows a deep commitment that goes beyond the manic. Yeah. Because you would be disappointed. Like you would be deep inside. Harrow would have been a little bit disappointed at, at not going the way he thought. Um, but I, I, I felt it was more like a resignation. So like, oh, well, yeah, I'm, I'm in too deep now. You know, so he's, um, but I mean, he still believes in what he believes, but he will, he will follow Amit because despite what she has said, um, he'll still do it. Um, mm -hmm. So, Her will, yeah. not his. Sorry, what was that? Her will, not his. Her will, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly, not his. Uh, big hello to Moonlit Comics as well. Hello. And uh, yeah, and Chris saying Harrow has conviction. Yeah, he certainly, uh, as you're saying, Drew, when the fights, well, actually, go and I just want to step back with the um, Rick, the Rick Ball. Uh, he did mention he loved the the kaiju fight. I, I love the Davies fighting, <laughs> the War of the Gods. Like, what did you guys think? I thought, I thought, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought that was playing out, but that wasn't necessarily visible for everyone. That was kind of like you know gods in the sky, whilst, mm. um, but I could be wrong. Uh, yeah, I don't think they ever showed any any people on the ground looking at them. But mm. the way that it was filmed was awesome. I think one of my favorite shots in the episode actually is uh, after Harrow uh, blasts Mark to the ground and he looks up and you see Harrow walking towards Mark uh, and mm -hmm. the camera starts to shift as Amit and Khonshu are like getting yeah. are falling over uh, in the opposite direction. It was such a cool shot. It was so good. <laughs> and like so was... weird, like so not Moon Knight, but still worked with Moon Knight. Like I thought that was... None of us expected when we got a Moon Knight show there'd be a giant kaiju oh. fight at the end. <laughs> it was a massive spectacle. Yeah. Um, oh, I had to ask myself, how can Kaiju be choke slam when he doesn't have a neck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he can't. Metaphorical. He can't choke him. Yeah, metaphorical. Um, invisible neck. Yeah. But I mean, Chad, uh, yeah, with, with episode six, like, um, what were your thoughts on, on the introduction, so to speak, of, of Armit? Uh, it, funnily enough, very easy to do. You just got to smash the shabdi, and and they're free. It, it's a very poor lock, I think. <laughs> to, <laughs> they didn't to the effort that went into like trapping these gods. All you gotta do is like drop yeah, it on. We, accident. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What if someone went to Antique Roadshow and they got one and they just dropped it on their, you know, <laughs> on their kitchen floor? Um, but yeah, um, what did you think with oh, the sorry, staging sorry. of the kaiju fight? It, it felt so. It felt like they were directly ripping off the Final Fantasy Kingsglaive movie because that's the exact oh. finale of that. It's you oh, got man, two combatants it. on the ground, and you got these giant like monsters in the background, and they're like riffing off of each other in combat with their own combatants. And it's like yeah. I I've seen this. This is a Square Enix production. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, but did, I mean, did you, did you enjoy it, nevertheless? Or? Yeah, I loved it. It was amazing. Mm. I think that I think that's where all the money went, like the CGI. Um, <laughs> there was also another shot of you guys remember when Conchu is like looking at the setting sun, and then Stephen um, Mark comes up to him and he negotiates that deal. My mm -hmm. God, that that look of Conchu with the setting sun, the light is just brilliant. Looks awesome. And, Brilliant. Yeah. Well, yeah. that is the first time we've seen both Kanshu and Moon Knight in the daytime. Mm -hmm. So ah, the, fact yeah. that the costume looked that good in sunlight. Yeah, yeah, did uh, that's a good point. That that's a uh, the first time you see them together. Um, because there has been critical remarks, I guess, on some of the CGI. I mean, I for granted, I, I did think some of them, some of the effects were a bit off in the earlier episodes, and it was a little they... video gamey at some points. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just so weird. It's like, like I, you know, like they need to give these new characters at least an extra two episodes for for space for the plot to breathe, and they need to just they're Marvel Studios. They're not lacking in funds. They need to just yeah. give the same <laughs> CGI budget they gave Falcon yeah. and Winter Soldier to a new character because wh why would you introduce a new character that you need people to stick with and not give them the same budget because you're going to lose people on that alone. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, I mean, I got over it because I was so excited to be watching it. But when oh, you go yeah, back yeah. and visit, it's yeah. very noticeable how much better the CGI is in the later episodes when they needed yeah. to lock it in. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because the yeah, fight I mean, scenes look insanely uh, good in episode six, and if you go back to episode two or like when they impale the jackal, it's cool, but it oh, looks yeah. like a cutscene from a Final Fantasy game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you could argue the fact. Uh, I was thinking like the the car chase in episode one. You could argue the fact that you know it was a dream sequence or something you know that made it look a little bit weird <laughs> yeah. i don't know uh, but yeah i mean that uh, a minor i think quibble but I, I guess my point was that it was phenomenal i think the the cgi and, the, and especially the last episode um i gotta say him flying really threw me off at first mm. but when i watched it the second time i didn't care and i thought it was so cool <laughs> <laughs> like i don't want to see him flying all the time but i think yeah. in a situation where Konshu whips him up and throws him and he I thought it was pretty badass, especially yeah. when him and Harrow came flying into Cairo, like linked on yeah. each other. And, and I don't know, it's it's pretty intense. I think it'd be cool to see that explored more. Yeah, yeah. I don't think he can fly like Superman. I actually, yeah. I, 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 I rewatched the episodes today and I, I paid close attention to that. And in the first scene, he goes up really high and he glides a straight line. If he could, if he could fl- control that flight in anything other than the, the controlled glide, he would have landed at the top of the pyramid, not the, uh, not halfway down. He yeah. never changed altitude other than to go down. <laughs> he never changed direction. Yeah. Um, so my my thinking, what basically was, is what you literally said. It's country threw him up really high. I, need to <laughs> like, just yeah. I also really yeah. liked that it was about to be Steven thrown in the air, and he's like, Mark, 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 take uh, this yeah, edge. Yeah. Can you imagine yeah. Yeah. throwing Mr. Knight yeah. up in the air? Yeah. Like, was getting ready to lift him. Yeah. Turn up, idiots. No, 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 Mark, you take this one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I like to think it was Conchu's, like, a, a, a one, maybe a one-off or a temporary thing that Conchu did. Just It's not something that Moon Knight yeah. can just produce on a whim. Uh, I a mean, big hello to Paul. In comics without much explanation he just sort of glides in he just glides yeah i mean down from a roof so this yeah. would just that sort of amped up a little bit oh, yeah. amped up uh, across <laughs> how, far, how far did he glide again it was like it was quite we a, don't know because we don't know where the tomb of alexander was oh, but yeah. the world record for a wingsuit is 32 kilometers okay so okay. theoretically he could be uh, flying <laughs> quite a distance because we don't know how yeah. how high up he started yeah and of course, he didn't have to worry about parachuting to a landing because he has the healing, yeah. so he could just crash into the side of the Great Pyramid. Exactly. So sure hurt. Must have been hell on his arms. K seven. It was definitely yeah. uh, gliding on a wind gust, not not flying. That was the wrong verbiage. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd like to think he's he's gliding as well. I mean, there were some shots where he was really horizontal to the ground just zooming across so unless there's a lot of really psyched to like maybe see him end up in new york and just doing that off of a building on his own what they've had awesome shots of i think noel mentioned it of these real sinkevich like shots of moon knight like it was that one where he's chasing the werewolf or the werewolf is chasing him Mm -hmm. and he jumps across a rooftop i mean pure like Sinkevich, I thought it was it was fantastic. So I'd love to see him in an urban setting. Uh, it'd be, it would be so fun. Uh, I guess oh, might as well now. I mean, we can still talk about episodes five and six, of course. But Drew, you mentioned before where you'd like to see where you think Moon Knight is going because I'm talking about urban settings now. So it's just, yeah. it's just kind of popped up. Um, let's start with uh, start with you, Drew. Then, uh, sure. then we'll go we'll go around. Where do you think well, the opportunities are? Um, Midnight Sun's obvious one. Uh, we'll see once Blade is established. I, everybody's getting so jacked on the Midnight Sun's possibilities, but I, I don't think we're going to see any movement on that until Blade mm-hmm. happens because that would be the obvious spot for it to start. Um, I really am hoping for that. Uh, I know he isn't necessarily integral to the Midnight Suns, but as we've discussed several times, I love Damnation, and even though his depiction in that was terrible, seeing him in live action. Midnight Suns would be incredible. Um, I think he could. It, it's been fun watching a lot of the showrunners and producers getting asked this question because, like, they all have so much fun speculating where they'd like to see him and how you don't you don't necessarily think of Moon Knight as being a team player, or someone that could work very well outside of being by himself. But he is actually really fun to watch around other people. And like, uh, yeah. I got really jacked watching him and Layla run into that fight together. Um, yeah. They worked really well as a duo. Um, I know in the Discord, I linked that Reddit video where somebody took the uh, they took the Civil War. Uh, yes, I saw that. They, <laughs> yeah. they, they uh, 
they edited in Moon Knight on top of where Spider Man usually is. Yep. And, Mr. Knight and watching Moon Knight, him yeah. watching the editing of him quipping with the Avengers during a Civil War fight and switching back and forth between suits, even though it was just a for fun video, it it like got me really excited at, see, at the possibility of seeing him interact with other characters, especially now that we know how how rough and tough this version of Mark is and how goofy this version of Steven is that mm. with other heroes in the MCU would be a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think he could have a really solid season two where Mark and Steven are learning to live their lives together. Uh, and clearly at the end of the season, there's still sand around the bed. They're still wake- worried about waking up in the middle of the night. They're still not addressing Jake, who's very clearly there. Yeah. Um, they could start working that in. Uh, and I think it would be cool to start seeing, you know, Frenchie show up or getting a look back at his time uh, as a Marine or something like that. So I would like to see a season two. I know Diab has come out and said that he would love to just make a movie. Um, oh, okay. I think he would really nail if he could just have, a you know, two hours to flesh out instead of a series. I think that would be really well or really good. Um, so there's a lot that I'd like to see him do and a lot that I think he'd be capable of. The one thing I wanted to point out is um, my buddy sent me this earlier and I thought it was really mm-hmm. interesting. On, I don't know who the user is, um, but on Reddit, somebody was doing a recap of all these uh, Marvel Phase 4 um, insider leaks or whatever you want to call them uh, from a guy who's been pretty spot on accurate with a lot of his things that he's posted. And mm-hmm. uh, apparently he came out. We'll see if this is even remotely true. But um, he said the main crew for Captain America 4 will obviously be Sam, Bucky and Joaquin Torres as a. Uh, I can't remember who he becomes. Um, he becomes Falcon. 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 Uh, yeah, new Falcon. Apparently, they uh, he has Moon Knight listed in here as being involved in the cast of Captain America Four. Oh, how that will work, I don't know, but I think that'd be really interesting. Yeah, well, d- interesting there. Um, it's yeah, a bunch of military I mean, people. Maybe they have you know Joaquin's Falcon character. Maybe he worked alongside Bushman yeah. and Mark when they were in the Marines together. Who knows? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Mario, uh, any ideas as to where we may see? Well, Please everyone go. seems to think Midnight Sun, but when you break it down, Moon Knight really isn't a mystical character. He yeah. has mystical powers, yeah, but he's not really. Actually, Chris, you just uh, mm. stole my thunder. No. <laughs> we don't get a second season where they address Jake and maybe bring in Bushman. I'd like to see Secret Avengers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that'd be cool. Uh, because we do, we do have a situation where Mark is some, somewhat of a street-level character. I mean, his powers, for the most part, the possible exception of flight, which we've already discussed, are basically, you know, run in, beat on people until they stop doing the, uh, what you don't want them to do anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and the very fact that Mr. Knight technically showed up in uh, Secret Avengers 19, I forget which volume, I think volume one. I think it was volume one, yeah. Um, and you, that kind of ties into what, what you just rumored, Drew. Which is, that was you know, going to be my question. So I never read Secret Avengers, but Cap Cap organized the Secret Avengers, didn't he? He was, yeah. yes. In, yeah. in so fact, that would be an interesting really thing for uh, for or, that'd be a really interesting thing for this uh, this version of Captain America to get involved in is organizing a Secret Avengers. Mm. Never even yeah. thought. Yeah, about maybe uh, this there'll be a situation where they don't want to be. You know the big flashy heroes, but they need to do something low key, kind of under the radar. And with how adamant uh, Sam was about fixing world government issues, I mm-hmm. could see him getting on board with doing something like that. That's a little more covert. Ooh. It's a and you know uh, Bucky as the Winter Soldier, White Wolf, or whatever he goes by nowadays, also somewhat of a Black Ops character. Mm-hmm. Yep. Man, yeah. you guys just got me all jacked. I didn't even think about that. The, <laughs> uh, Joaquin Torres is, I don't actually, I'm not actually that familiar with the comic book character, but mm-hmm. Bucky's ex military. Sam mm-hmm. is ex military, Air Force, not Army. Moon Knight is ex military. For all we know, Bushman could be the villain. Mm. Oh, I'm not saying he is. I'm not even going to make that claim because, frankly, Sam has plenty of villains of his own to play with. Yeah. But um, he could easily be a, um, you know, cheap flunky or a dragon, as Stevie Triplex to put it. 
Um, so you could get, I, I could see uh, Mark fitting in there, either in a movie with uh, his own issues as a subplot or in, a, in another series of Secret Avengers and so forth. Because there's also a subplot that hasn't been played with yet. Mm-hmm. Which is uh, Contessa Valentina de la Fontaine. Ah, uh, yeah, yes. all over the place. She's I would, I would love that. nothing more than to watch Stephen interact with my queen Elaine. <laughs> <laughs> that would be so fun. <laughs> that would so, be cool. Uh, and she's also comes from a black ops background, so mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yep, I could yeah. see that working. That could, yeah, absolutely. There's so many um, moving parts in the MCU now that I forget about some of these characters. I don't pay that much. Like, I pay attention yeah, to all of them, but I'm sure. more on board with, like, the weirdo characters, so I kind of forget, like, what, what the political, yeah. more political-affiliated ones are out doing. It, it's it's so diverse, the universe now, which is so so great. I mean, you got Corners, you got the Cosmic as well. Um, Chad, uh, what do you think? Uh, we've got Secret Avengers, we've got Midnight Suns. Where do you think maybe Moon Knight will pop up next? Well, I mean, so I rewatched episode six and the post credit, obviously the whole Jake thing. Um, I looked at the skyline when he was exiting the mental facility and it's London again. So he's still operating within the same bounds as, you know, Mark and Steven living in the Mm -hmm. flat. And then I, I'm not sure when we're supposed to be coming out, even or even if it is part of the proper MCU. But, I mean, right now, what else is going on in London? I mean, it's... Uh, Diane Whitman? Let's look exactly. At <laughs> and Blade. Yeah. Blade so, well. yeah, yeah it, it really makes sense for them all to come across each other. If, if, especially if we're to, to... If we are to believe that St- where Stephen and Mark wake up at the end of the episode is reality, and they are still living in London, mm-hmm. then... You know, Blade being based in London, Dane Whitman still being in London, clearly showing up in the Blade movie, it would stand to reason that they're going to run into him too. And yeah. I think that's pretty interesting to have them all meeting up in the UK. And I'm pretty happy. It's weird for Moon Knight, but it's cool that they're keeping those characters centralized to where they're from. And it, I think yeah. maybe that's why they had him stationed in the in the UK to begin with. Maybe you know how Feige plans these things out so far in advance. It mm-hmm. wouldn't surprise me that that's why they had him working in a British museum. Yeah. 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 Um, how about Daniel? How about you? Uh, what do you reckon? Oh, I I have so many thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> like, cause like like um like you guys were saying earlier, like you know again, you know, Midnight Suns. Because I really feel like Blade is gonna kind of be like the new Nick Fury. Like he's gonna be the one showing up at like the end oh. credit scenes. Okay. And like, oh, you know, I've got a mission for you because you thought Thanos was bad. Wait until you meet. So and so, and it could be like a huge supernatural <laughs> threat. Like it could be, like it could be Lilith. It could be Dracula. Yeah. I mean, he does owe Moon Knight money, you know. <laughs> Apparently, they tried to get that line in the in the TV show somewhere. They just couldn't pull it off. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> um, yeah. Look, I think also don't discount. We've got Werewolf by Night coming up. I think there's a... That's like the most line. obvious one and keeps getting glossed over, but it would be oh, a yeah. real shame if he didn't pop up in there at all. Because, or... Yeah, because the, the lead actor, uh, he's a Spanish actor. I don't know where it's going to be set, but it could be in Europe again. So again, it could be right for, for Mark, Steve, who's in UK, to, to bounce wherever it is. Um, also, Secret Invasion. I, it might. I mean, I know they've wrapped, so maybe not, because it just seems too close um but i think you might get the who's who uh, in that tv show i mean if it's anything like the comics then we will be getting some surprise like appearances of people um i, I still think sharon card is a scroll i don't know about you guys uh, just with her power breaking thing um but yeah, i really yeah. want i really want her to be a scroll <laughs> that would be so yeah like but uh, yeah the whole secret invasion thing really blows my mind. I really hope we get to see like like characters like like Moon Knight, like Blade, like the Black Knight. Yep. Like there's something going on where they couldn't be like replaced or something like that. Like they're the only ones that you know could not be scrolls. Like Mark mm-hmm. because of his DID. I mean, what scroll is going to be able to even try and so, tackle that? That's a really good point. How does a scroll yeah. replicate multiple yeah. personalities? 
It'd be kind of really no, it wouldn't be sure. funny. It'd be very offensive. But like to watch a scroll mm. try to take Mark's personality and then try to like fake having a second accent, it just looks like bad acting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it probably wouldn't fly. <laughs> and again, uh, I think that would kind of really be cool to play because another thing with like Secret Avengers, because if if you remember, um, when we're first introduced to Sam in Winter Soldier, when he was Falcon that was still kind of like a black ops thing. Like they didn't like go around announcing that Sam mm -hmm. had these wings, like him and his partner had yeah. these like, like mechanical wings they used for these uh, like missions and stuff. So that could definitely play into like a sort of black ops sort of uh, feel for it. So mm -hmm. I think Sam would have that kind of background. Plus, you know, you never know. They could get, you know, Chris Evans to come back and put on the old man makeup and like, he leaves like these, mm -hmm recordings for Sammy and like Sam, you know, I was watching stuff throughout this new history that's been made. There are certain things that need to be corrected. And by the time I get caught up, I'm going to be too old. Damn, if, you got me all excited over here. <laughs> that's such, so a cool have, like, these, such a cool these idea. Video diaries from like Steve Rogers, where he's like, in a poem, and he's like, Sam, there's this yeah. Latvian dictator that's going to come to power. By the time you know you, uh, oh, you pick so up cool. the shield, yeah, you need to make sure he doesn't get too too you know big, and uh, make sure his economy is in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. After Multiverse of Madness, me and uh, my buddy that read Secret Wars together were getting getting all excited about Secret Wars related stuff, and I, I brought up like, man, it's a real shame that we're not going to get to see angry old man captain get super pissed off about the Illuminati. Uh, <laughs> but that would be a way for old man cap to come back as if he was leaving notes for, for Sam mm. to follow and to form the yep. secret Avengers. And I think that uh, if that's not in MCU now, I'm going to be very upset. <laughs> I mean, I, I doesn't need to be, but that's a really cool idea, Daniel. Yeah. yeah thanks. Uh, Is there a, I, um, sorry, Jenny. I got a, I got to hop off guys, but uh, yeah, okay. it's been really nice. No, good to good to catch up, uh, Daniel. We're, we'll wrap up soon anyway. But no, thank you so much um, for for joining us. Thank you, thank Mr. You Knight, as well. <laughs> well I'll, I'll make sure to tell him you you guys all said bye. All right, you guys have a good one. You too, catch up. So yeah. Um, there is one question that uh, <clears throat> the uh, mid credit scene kind of brought up mm -hmm. uh, that we haven't addressed, and maybe we can we can fit it in. Yep. Well, it's actually two questions, kind of related. Mm -hmm. uh, one is the is the casual one, which is, you know, where did Jake get the money for the limousine? <laughs> I mean, we know that Mark's fairly wealthy, but at the end of the TV show, assuming everything is real the way you expect it to be, they're living in a flat. We don't have yeah. a Stephen Grant mansion, so we shouldn't have a Stephen Grant limo. And the second question, which I think is the really fun one to think about, is how long has Jake been working for Kanchu? Mm. Did he start working for Kanchu after this episode? You know, when he let Stephen and Mark go? Or was he or has he been working for Kanchu all this time? Yeah. I'm assuming it, it's the latter because I mean, I mean again, that's just my assumption. Only because they they mentioned Conchu mentions um because he alluded to that he wanted to find another avatar you know and we all thought it was Layla but he said I think he said something like who who you know whoever said it was going to be like Layla so I, yeah he I said think why, maybe he jumped why would I ever need someone else when Mark has no idea how truly troubled he really is mm. which puts enough doubt in it for me not to answer that question yeah. Yeah, that's true. But no, uh, they, I think he, I, I, I would I could see Jake having been going at it for a while, and I could see Jake uh, and Kanchu having been smart enough to uh, reroute Mark's Merc funds somewhere that he could use them uh, in private. Well, he yeah. still uses the name because the license plate is SPKTR. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It does, oh, which was <laughs> like a sloppy Easter egg, but I was too excited to care. Yeah. He wanted yeah. he wanted Mark to take the heat for anything. You know, <laughs> well, the, the, I guess he have a passport. Uh, yes. You have an identity, but he doesn't necessarily have paperwork. Mm -hmm. Yes. So yeah. he's probably using Mark's name. Yeah, true. Oh, he can pass off his... Yes. Um, like for, you know, getting more money and all that jazz. If they have rerouted a bunch of Mark's cash from being a Merc, I mean, with Secret 
invasion coming up. Maybe it's dataless uh, genetic sequencing, like in the comics. Hi. I don't remember that, so I'll take your word for it. Um, I forgot what part of which run, but that's where he gets like the second big windfall of his cash. Uh, he goes no. absolutely broke, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, hey, you made all these investments in the oh, genetic sequencing, oh, yeah. and that was right before Secret Invasion came out. Interesting. Oh, I ah. forgot about that. He mentions that, yeah. Yeah. No, the earliest I remember is 2014, where he basically says, you know, this is all, this is money from all of the criminals that I yeah. um, defeated. Or yeah. he could have been, uh, he could have been, sorry, uh, running like, you know, he could have been as basic as him selling relics or something like that from yeah. their globe trotting behind behind mark and steven's back but i, I like that theory too because i do remember him saying that and i didn't read the the secret invasion run myself but it's interesting to know that that may have factored into that in the comics <laughs> look i think it's also you guys are missing the the blatantly of obvious the occam's razor that um like you know a whole bunch of high school girls you know jake's just gone and hired the limo just for the day <laughs> so, <laughs> it just happened to say specter on it yeah, he's he's like i like that one <laughs> um mario you've got a fan here Joe, yeah he's uh, old totally aghast that might just remember something mario shame on you <laughs> um yeah no uh yeah so very good uh, good some good um questions there mario i, I don't know we'll, again we'll have to see it seems again sarah goha uh, i'm sorry if i mispronounce her name one of the producers uh, was an article saying that they're definitely you know they're, they're looking towards a season two it's the way they've fashioned it um although taking nothing away from what you said drew as well i think it's beautifully done as a, a, a uh, entire piece unto itself you know uh the season you could walk away and that could still be you know not enough that uh, there can still be enough there to close it out without being too many loose ends you know if you, yeah forget, and i'm sure they did that on purpose it. i just can't yeah. i can't see disney and marvel having put so much work into a character to not um, do more with them yeah it, it would be a it would be a first for them for sure I really yes. think it's the Emmy thing. They're trying to get yeah, the yeah, for sure. Emmy, so yeah, yeah, I think the Emmy. They're playing. Yeah. Oh no, no, we don't have plans. And yeah. Diab said in an interview recently too, like a post-season interview, uh, how much he wants to explore Jake and how like all mm -hmm. these ideas he has for continuing that. So, uh, yeah. if we don't get it, it won't be for lack of the creative team wanting to or having ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it looks like reception for the show has overall kind of been been good so um that's a good sign that we will get more uh, which is good look guys we haven't actually touched so oh, apologies haven't touched too much on the listener feedback sorry loonies um just to, to round it off unless guys have you got any other particular topics or points of episodes five or six that you think we may not have covered um i kind of want to talk about uh the first generation of steven um mm -hmm. So I kind of got caught up on the idea that, you know, you guys were talking about Steven being like the ideal, like that Mark was trying to like save a piece of himself to make him more pure. You're like, well, he doesn't deserve to get beat on and then created Steven. Well, and then you said, then Steven might have created Jake. Mm. It's weird to think about that because I agree with Wendy Spector. I think that Mark has been extremely uh, jealous of Robo the entire childhood. Mm -hmm. And as young as Mark was, I don't see how, uh, I don't know, he could embody that kind of noble, like, idealism that, like, all of a sudden he has to separate a piece of his head mm. into this, like, separate being. I would think that he would try and stash himself somewhere else. <clears throat> so I would completely understand all of a sudden, like you try and make Steven well, then Steven creates someone else to get away from it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I just don't see the mentality <clears throat> working out that For while, Mark. Yeah. Huh? I was thinking that Steven was an idealized version of his brother. I'm mm. not sure I buy that because of some other details, but yeah. that might play into it as well. Okay. If he was jealous of his brother, maybe he tried to become his brother. Oh, okay. 
Yeah. I mean, they both loved Tomb Buster, you, you know. Um, so uh, in that sense, yeah, I don't know where I'm going with that. But, like, <laughs> but um, yeah, for sure. It, interesting, Chad. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I haven't the really got the only other point I could think to touch on, and it's this is odd for me because I'm usually so positive about all this stuff, but I, I did want to discuss one pointy end, as you guys were referring to him uh, as. Yeah, sure. Is uh, just the any ad, which was a bummer because – Diab did such a fantastic job with the Egyptian uh, lore and representation and everything. Uh, mm -hmm. I think ultimately this just came down to the restriction of the six episode time. But I I wanted the Ennead to be so much cooler than they were. Yeah. Uh, they were just so dumb when they had that chamber uh, judgment scene. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. yeah. Which a lot of people have commented on. And then uh, rewatching episode six today, like, they just they uh harold wipes the floor with all of them yeah. and after watching moon knight have this borderline invincible suit for the first six episodes why doesn't like osiris's i avatar mm. have a cool suit yeah. um too seeing, passive, too passive, seeing that maybe. wall of avatar seeing yeah. that wall of ushaptis never yeah. got an explanation as to why all those guys were locked up mm. or yeah. why none of them were set free um, they, and they did a lot of really interesting tiny details that I really appreciated, like uh, like when Tawera is explaining the dua and the uh, balancing of the the heart um, to Mark and Stephen in the psych yep. ward. She's reading off notes, and that's because it's not her job; it's Anubis's job. But Anubis mm. is locked up. That was a really interesting detail to see oh, her right. frantically skipping through notes, not knowing. Yeah, wow. She's like, "Sorry, like she yeah. that's clearly not her usual job." Yeah, it was right. an awesome touch, but then to just never find out why Anubis is locked up in Anushapti, it was a lot of like really cool setup. That that was like the only part of the show that I ultimately ended up not liking is mm -hmm. like the the lack of like depth to the Ennead, and yeah, I, 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 ultimately yeah. it's just a lack of time in the show. I think, but that yeah. would have been something that would have been greatly benefited by more time to explore. Yeah, well, I, I think the missed opportunity. Theory. I always have a theory about why the avatars went down so easily mm -hmm. and it all boils down to the fact that how Har harrow didn't defeat the gods he judged he the avatars yeah mm. the the approach he uses the exact same thing he used for you know judging people and okay so, so there wasn't like a big fight a god fight in there it was the avatars he, getting judged and the bodies the human bodies were toast Except for except for the Osiris avatar, because Osiris is probably it, it is God of the Day, he probably has some resistance to that. Mm -hmm. But we didn't actually, with the exception of Kanshu and Tawaret and Amit, we didn't actually see the gods themselves. No. So they're still kind of open to interpretation, unless they show up in Thor, which we may or may not see. Joel Joel Lewis had a good comment here. Uh, he said yeah. the thing about the other Ennead is there. Uh, their avatars are not necessarily physical avatars the way Khonshu makes his. Um, they're not fists of their gods. That makes yep. sense. Those people were, they spoke for their gods, uh, yep. but they weren't necessarily getting outfitted to go to war for they're their not, gods. Yeah, they're not, they're not warriors. Um, okay. I think I even us, yeah, I think even Osiris says, or, or one of them um, might have been Horus says, oh, look, you're garish, you know. Conch you with your your garish weapons and, and armor that's true and all that. he, so, he he talks yeah. shit on the way his his avatar looks and acts yeah okay so, so never mind that i mean it's still any ad could have used but, the whole episode to explore in of themselves but no i agree i, I but think i like bringing that up because i wanted to hear those types of points to like that yeah. makes it a little more understandable and like yeah makes more sense no, but, to me. but i mean i agree i i think the there's a missed opportunity there i mean um because, you know, it was also outlined as the War of the Gods. We, we did see Amit and Konshu at the end, but I, I assumed it was going to be a lot more than that. But again, just constraints of the time in the TV show and what we... CMK7 had a good point here, too. He said that the mm -hmm. other gods just didn't necessarily give a shit what was going on on Earth. True. Yeah. They, yeah, they true. openly say that they don't want to interrupt with what, yeah. what's going on on Earth. Well, that is exactly what Amit and Konshu want to be doing. Yeah, absolutely. They're the okay. proactive ones. That's why I bring these things up. <laughs> <laughs> pointy and uh, less pointy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, it could still, yeah, it still be pointy. Uh, but that's, I mean, in the scheme of things, it's it's all good. Um, anything else, guys? Before we wrap up, I'm just mindful of the time as well. I know, um, uh, Mario, um, Chad, are you uh, any any other points that you want to raise? 
Uh, not offhand, maybe uh, on the topic of the Ennead, how Bast is missing. Mm. Probably because Bast wanted to get in on stuff on Earth. Yeah, it's like, I well, mean, we'll... we're not going to screw with you too much because she's been gone for so long. So yeah. probably just like shooed her off to her part of Africa and just kind of let that go. I, I think I nope. saw some YouTube guy talking, and this is just speculation, but he his, he was saying that the reason Bast wasn't shown or wasn't around is, uh, I guess, in the Black Panther comic lore, Bast arrived on Earth with the, um, and I, I could be butchering this, but it was that she arrived on Earth with the vibranium meteor that landed in Wakanda, and she stayed there, and so she only oh. exists in Wakanda and in the um, ancestral plane. So oh. they clearly have stated that the other, uh, that the Enead exists in the Overvoid, which is a different area entirely. So Bass doesn't yep. necessarily coincide with the Enead. Oh. So she swanned out to do her own thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's gone, gone rogue, gone maverick. Um, now that's fair enough. Uh, I'd, again, I would love to see, again, we'll have Wakanda forever um, this I, year. That'd be a really cool spot for him to pop up. I don't know if, mm. it, it would, if he could, but. It would be interesting. Maybe, or maybe a mention at least, you know. Running mm -hmm. around in a white hood. Yeah. <laughs> okay, maybe not. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> be a bad look in Wakanda. <laughs> yep. Um, well, guys, I think that about wraps it. Sorry, we, we are um, short on time now. Loonies, thank you so much for all your feedback as well. Sorry we didn't get to uh to much of it but i'm I'm glad that the discussion is being held in the discussion threads i mean people were responding to each other and, and stuff just getting the discussion going so um thank you so much for for interacting in the group and and sharing your thoughts as well a big thank you to you guys as well uh in absentia daniel doing but um to mario digicom uh to the power of chat to turntables <laughs> Uh, a huge thank you guys it's it's uh, always fun to to chat with you you must be absolutely gassed drew i don't know you got i'm you more know, energized now than i was at the beginning because you guys got me all hamped up <laughs> <laughs> oh and also a big thank you to our live stream commenters commentators as well a big thanks to, to chris cmk7 and joel uh, moonlit comics uh, we saw paul in there as well he's been on the panel and uh, and mario's mate here i think john um how do you pronounce that name, Mario? Uh, Dedalus? Dedalus. Dedalus. Yeah, De Dedalus uh, Gavoni. But thank you so much for, for interacting with us while we're, you know, talking about something that we love to, to talk about. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, uh, guys, do you want to do you want to plug anything? I mean, before we, we head off, I, I, you know, I'd like to offer that at least. Um, uh, I mean, it's not my thing, but we got Black, White and Blood this Wednesday, don't we? Oh, yes, yep. yeah. my living. Go <laughs> check it out, uh, Rebecca. And I've I'll had an absolute blast with the show, as I expected to. Huge MCU nerd, but I'm I'm excited to get back to having regular comic releases. Yeah. I feel like oh. I haven't read a new Moon Knight comic in weeks. <laughs> yeah, I haven't. So, yeah, it's, and we might it, as well plug Jed's run as well. Yes, we start on Moon Knight. The first issue of this run of this current run is a great jumping on point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's fantastic. Look, we've been all caught up with the TV show, and and that's, I think that's fair enough. I mean, this has been such a, a wild like dream of a ride for us. I was just making the most of it. Hence, the two episodes per. per well, I gotta um, really TV applaud show. you yeah. for that, Ray. Like you and Rebecca for sure. Like, I was really interested to see, but between doing the comics and the show and seeing how the podcast would grow during the show, which it clearly has, um. Like hats off to you guys for I think oh, you guys you. have crushed being a very niche character podcast and getting a TV show worked <laughs> in. Uh, yeah. I've, I've been really excited over the past couple of years listening to this show, like hearing you guys speculating all the way back when it first got announced and like yeah. to the point where you were doing two episodes a week and everything. It's just been really awesome to watch. So yeah. hats oh. off to you guys for how you've done it. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, it's an absolute pleasure. And it just, you know, love, love to just chat Moon Knight. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's exactly why Rebecca and I do it. And we're just fortunate enough to have a show, a TV show, uh, you know, but we've also got beautiful comics coming up ahead. So loonies do not go anywhere. Uh, a big thank you again to our Patronis. Uh, look, you know, we've got a couple of them over here. So a big thanks to Odin, Daniel, Drew, Frank, Justin, Derek, Kyle, Wayne, Jordan, Josh, 
James, Anthony, Russell, Michael, Mario, Gavin, and Matthew. Um, I'd like to apologize for the likes of a big shout out to, oh, big shout out to Tommy, the man on the streets. He was going to come on, uh, but he couldn't make it. Just uh, some some family commitments. And a big shout out to Anthony Sitko. Uh, happy 40th, Anthony. I hope you are getting back slappingly drunk as we speak. <laughs> um, I just want to actually, I just got reminded. Uh, so Tommy sent me, I'm just, let's just cap it off with, with Tommy's thoughts on the show. Uh, he says uh, his brief spectorlation, I guess, or take. Uh, I quite enjoyed episode six. While a wham bam, thank you, ma'am, to the cliffhanger of episode five. I'd much rather take this fairly tight ep- six episode season that solidifies a future for the character than a drawn out action fest with little character development. Conchu decked out in a bespoke suit, the Spectre Mobile and the Sinkevich uh, facility were a lovely final piece of the pie. Uh, Layla acting as Tawaret's avatar was a highlight, furthering the rabbit holes of the MC, and he's got then MU's mythos. Uh, Hawks, Ethan Hawks assumed death is a bummer. I'd like, uh, I'd take the rest wrapped with a bow. Thank you very much. I got everything I wanted out of this Moon Knight series. Couldn't be happier with the outcome. And, uh, and finally, the introduction of Jake must signal a future for Oscar Isaac in the MCU. I'm thrilled to support the show and whatever may await Moon Knight in the future. Break a leg all um, with the recording. See you on the streets. So uh, thank you, Tommy. Um, yes, very much it sounds like you, he enjoyed the show as well. So a huge thanks, Tommy, for leaving us your thoughts there as well. Uh, a big final thank you to, to Drew again, uh, to Daniel Doing, he was just here, and Frank the Think Tank. Oh, geez, I've got to have Frank on the show again. He's a, he's a blast. Um, principal sponsors. Um, you can uh, follow Daniel Doing's Fringe Night at patreon.com slash fringe night 27. Uh, Drew Toombs, you've got awesome music. Mario, get on it. Come on. Chad, get on it. Um, um, soundcloud.com slash tombs with a Z and lurk music, um, lurk music with a CK dot bandcamp dot com. Fantastic music. Uh, and Frank the Tanks, uh, Instagram, Moon Knight Vision with a, with a Z as well. Go check that out. All, all in the show notes. Uh, finally, please follow or consider CLZ. Um, they're a comic database, comic book database um, thingy. Um, they're pretty cool at collectors.com and dreamland comics use the code moon and get 20% off all their stuff. Um, finally, we are part of the collective fantastic bunch of shows, um, props to each and every one of them. There's, they're so fun to listen to go listen to capes and lunatics, go listen to inner demons, a ghost rider podcast, or also as well. I am your target demographic on YouTube. Um, Adam does a great reviewing there. And finally, email us at feedback at itkmoonlight.com. Uh, we've got a website. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Discord, Get Vocal, and Podchaser. And if you want to leave a review, please do. Uh, you know, it would be good if it's high, um, but let us know if we need to change anything or how we can improve. We're always open to that as well. Uh, guys, a huge thank you once again. Um, thank you so much. Uh, and... Um, yeah, thank you so much, Mario. I'll see you online. Drew, I'll see you online as well. Power of Chad, I'll see you online. Or the next time we do a Let's Get Sheet Faced, I'm up for that. Right. <laughs> as, as always, everyone, thanks for listening. And may Conchu watch over the denizens of the night. Catch you later. Moon Knight and affiliated characters, stories and events are properties of Marvel Characters Incorporated. Materials used and discussed within the podcast are intended for critique and review purposes only under the fair dealing concept of the current Copyright Act. The views, information or opinions expressed during the podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of the copyright owners.